everyone. This is Bill Griffin. Welcome to Different Take Podcast. If you like this content, please subscribe, like, share, comment. Uh, new episodes Tuesdays and Thursdays. And today I have the privilege of interviewing uh, Mr. Sean Still, who is a Republican candidate for State Senate. District 48 is the owner and president of Olympic Pool Plastering in Shot Creek has resided in Johns Creek for 20 years and is the father of three children. And I really appreciate you doing this. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about your district. That you're running so um, it's, it's a small sliver of Alpharetta, the Lake Windward area. It's, uh, it's Johns Creek. It's uh, southern uh, edge of Forsyth County. So everything south of the coming city limits unincorporated uh, Forsyth, and then the uh, northwestern edge of Gwinnett County, so Swanee, Sugar Hill, and Buford between Peachtree Industrial Boulevard and the Chattahoochee River going all the way up to Lake Lanier, including Buford Dam. i got a few questions just on uh, things that concern parents and public schools. Uh, I did a few episodes on uh, uh, Gwinnett County School Board and also interviewed the candidates, and there's those are online, but the what are you in favor of the concept of school choice for K through 12 and, and Kevin to share uh, what you think about that concept? So school choice um, is a, a critical mass issue for, for our district, for our state. Um, I'm, I was really disappointed to see it not pass the legislature in this past session. Um, I know that for people in, in Forsyth, Gwinnett, in North Fulton, um, it, is, it is critically important that, that parents have that option, whether it's in the form of a voucher or just the opportunity to be able to change schools. Um, parents have that right and, and children have that right to be able to choose that. Um, I think that the, <clears throat> the, the problems that we had in not getting that passed are things that, that we need to solve before we go into the next session so that we can try to get this passed in 2023. What would those problems be? Largely, as it is explained to me by people that uh, that voted against the bill, uh, largely it's because the the fear of losing teacher jobs, um, and in in small rural counties where there might only be one school system, um, there really aren't any options for children to to have a choice of where to move to, um, and if you if the dollars follow the child out of the school system, then if you lose X number of students for, for you know, there's a, a formula to that. And um, as you lose students, you lose funding, therefore you lose teachers and they have to be cut. And um, a lot of legislators voted against it because um, the school systems um, were afraid that they were gonna lose teacher jobs. And if you vote for a bill that costs teachers and constituents their jobs, uh, you're not going to be around next year to, to, uh, to do anything else in the, in the legislature. So they voted for their uh, constituents, which were against it. And so there were, there were two very differing schools of thought. You know, in Metro Atlanta, we see school choice as something that's very favorable because we do have options and our school systems are big enough to, to sustain you know, dollars moving in and out. But when you go into more rural parts of the state, um, it's a radically different um, lands and what they have to do with uh, how, how to deal with that. Um, and if, if we zoom out, you know, a little bit further from our state and we look to the south, you know, Ron DeSantis became governor of Florida on this one singular issue. Ron DeSantis ran on this issue and, and this is how he became governor of Florida was, you know, he, he won in a very, very narrow margin of crossover vote uh, of, of moms who crossed over, you know, longtime Democrats who voted for him on this one singular issue because it was so important to Florida. Um, and, you know, I, I think that we need to, to, you know, try to follow that example um, and to, to continue to push this forward into the next session. The, the complaint that it I've heard is, um, well, it's public, it, it's public funds. It can't, we're not, we're not taking funds out to, for, um, to privately. It's just a non-starter with some Democrats I've interviewed. Let's put it that way, because they're, 
adamantly opposed to moving any funds out of the public school system. Right. And that's that's how it was for, for the Republicans that voted against it in rural Georgia because they don't want the dollars to leave the local school system. But the, the interesting thing about that is the, the voucher, the, the parent ostensibly would be a voucher, uh, but right. the parent would receive never amounts to the cost of the, the actual, the cost that, of the the pupil, right? Right. Well, what is $6,000. Typical, what is $6, the typical differential? Let's say it's $10,000 for the pupil. What would the voucher typically be for the uh, parent that you, well, for the child? $6,000 is the number that they've been using. Which is um, 60%. And, and that's, so if, I mean, I'm mean, assuming, uh, let's say it's $10,000 is what it costs. So the, the parent would get uh, 60% of, it just seems like there's money left over. I don't understand the concept of there being, that all this money's been sucked out of the system. I mean, the teachers unions obviously are, are what's driving that message, I think with, with the democratic perspective and platform. Um, I'm just trying to look at it as a more local control issue and not make it a statewide issue. Um, I think that on a county by county basis, it, you know, if, if there is a way to break it down to that granular level, that would be the way to, to, to make this work. I mean, if, if we consider the fact that, that one out of three Georgia schools have a failing grade right now, and, and if you have two counties that, that each are at a failing grade in terms of, of metrics and, and success rates, the kids don't have anywhere to transfer to anyway, sadly. Um, they don't have private school options. They don't have um, you know, a super high performing school next to a school that's, that's failing. Um, so you know, we, we, we have a much bigger problem to solve than, than just school choice. I mean, we have to solve the school choice issue. And then on top of that, we have to be able to address the fact that one out of three Georgia schools are, are failing right now. One of the other issues that's uh, it's on your website also, what parents are concerned about is uh, people claim that uh, CRT is not taught in schools. What do you think of that? Uh, it's absolutely being taught in Gwinnett County. Um, I, uh, I have a picture saved on my phone of a uh, middle school in Gwinnett County where the librarian uh, has a, a t-shirt hanging in her office for you know full display. Like imagine a, a t-shirt on a hanger right here behind me saying read woke um that, that that's is absolutely um being taught whether it's it's in a curriculum or if it's just in a, an entire school philosophy um it is very much there and so um just as i think most parents don't want there to be early elementary education on sexuality and you know identification uh there should also equally be um you know, concern that that we're not teaching uh, this type of divisive uh, culture curriculum um, in our elementary schools, our middle schools, and our high schools. I mean, there's just no place for it at all. So, is the, are you hearing about that from constituents? Says it's a big deal, or in our, our on the opposite side, are some constituents saying, "Oh, this is not a big deal." Uh, what I hear consistently is that um, in Gwinnett County, they say we don't want to become DeKalb. And in Forsyth and Fulton, all I hear is we don't want to become Gwinnett. And so it is a slippery slope of what's happening in these school systems that they don't want to become uh, the neighbor to the south or the neighbor to the east. And, and you know, what we see happening there and we're, we're trying to stop it. So I don't know that we're going to reverse the tide, but at least um, let's let's you know, drop the anchor and stop it from sliding further. So I was on the subject of a sexual orientation being discussed in public school. Um, a Democrat says, well, we can't have any uh, discrimination against these, uh, <laughs> against folks. I mean, that's their, what they kind of stick to, I guess. Maybe I'm not phrasing that correctly, but uh, are you hearing okay. the same thing? Is that the if they're saying that it's non-discriminatory, then let's just not talk about it at all. I mean, it, you know, being told not to talk about something is not discriminatory. Um, it's saying, let's focus on why we're here. We're here to learn and we're here to educate our children. We're not here to talk about um, what a teacher's personal life involves. Um, I just don't think that there's a place for that. Um, 
I just got back um, from Alaska early this morning and uh, I was with some friends uh, from the swimming pool industry from California. And they said that, that in uh, LA County, they are now teaching in second grade. And this is coming from parents that, that the children are being asked in the second grade how they want to identify. In the second grade, they don't even know what they want for lunch and they're being asked to identify and to choose what their pronoun is gonna be. I mean, the, the fact that, that this is even a conversation in this country just absolutely infuriates me. I, I have three daughters who are 11, 14, and 16. And I will fight like hell against anybody that, that's going to try to teach them that, um, that they have to, to, to make the, you know, life decisions about who they're supposed to be or anything else. I mean, that's for them to decide, not for a school system to be teaching it to them. The, the thing I noticed is with the Gwinnett uh, School Board, the meetings, it's a parade of uh, administrators, teachers, board members, and even students and they spend just an inordinate amount of time talking about uh, diversity, equity, uh, inclusion, colonization, uh, but they, they don't really talk about discrimination very much. Uh, is, is, you, is that what you're kind of, you see the same oh, absolutely. thing? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it, it, the, the it, things that I have heard. Some people poo-poo it and say, oh, no, 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 we're, it's not really that big of a deal. But uh, is it, I guess my question to you is, is that a big deal? It's absolutely a big deal. It is a huge deal. Um, I talk to educators in Gwinnett County on a, on a very regular basis. And even though I live in Fulton, my business is in Gwinnett. I employ over 100 Gwinnettians. Um, and so by extension, I have several hundred uh, children that are uh, in Gwinnett school systems that, that are directly impacted by my company. So yes, I am, I am deeply uh, acutely aware of, of what's happening. Um, they're mostly Hispanic and they, um, they tell me on a, on a very regular basis. I mean, the, the types of things that, that they're being taught and um, you are a majority to minority county. Um, I think that's that's part of the beauty of of when it is the melting pot that it is. But um, you know they, they keep talking about in in the school board meetings they're they're continuously about the need for more diversity and more this and more that. Look at the the simple reason of you know what happened to. The, in my opinion, the greatest you know school superintendent our state's ever seen. Uh, you're talking about Alva Wilbanks. Actually, it's, uh, maybe a little bit, um, uh, maybe two or three sentences before you inserted his name. You might want to start there if you can remember that. Sure. So you know, Alvin Wilbanks is is one of the greatest superintendents our state has ever had. He built Gwinnett into what it is today. People moved to Gwinnett County for the schools, and then um, this new woke culture. Um, came in and and very openly, very brazenly said that they wanted to replace Will Banks, not on the merit, not on retirement, but to replace him uh, for diversity's sake. And um, and I just see that as a complete travesty. And he's been nothing but honorable and 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 you know forthright about you know just just wanted to do what's right for the county, but. Um, but I, I, I see that there are bad actors within the Gwinnett County school system that are, are continuing to push this beyond the point of reason. Um, and, and they want to bring a new curriculum that is, is you know, making a lot of people say, you know, you're, you're putting in so many changes so fast here that, that maybe we need to pump the brakes a little bit and, and make sure that what we're doing here makes good long-term sense. Maybe let's, let's let some other uh, counties or some other states, you know, test some of these new theories first before we start launching into so many new programs uh, with, without there being any any basis of understanding of what the long term effects are. Another subject I was interested to hear from you was um, on a tax policy. You prefer consumption tax rather than 
income tax. It's something I suppose sort of similar to what Florida does. Yes. So Florida makes up their uh, their tax deficit uh, largely through um, taxing uh, visitors, right? So a bed tax to hotels. There's you know the cost of fuel is twenty five to fifty cents higher per gallon than what we experience here in Georgia. Um, I know you can't do it overnight, uh, but if we look at ways to ratchet down our tax rate to be more competitive with Texas, Tennessee, Florida. Um, I think as we can lower our state income tax, it will make us more competitive. And, you know, one of the major issues that uh, Republicans always talk about in the legislature is, you know, trying to reduce the number of um, industries that have tax credits. Well, if, if you're eliminating or reducing the state income tax and you're going to more of a consumption based tax, that inherently reduces or eliminates the need for tax credits um, that would have been given anyway. So whether it's airlines, whether it's the film industry, um, it, it sort of levels the, the playing field for everyone. And I, I think that's definitely the way to go. So I do recognize fiscally, you can't just snap your fingers and overnight replace it. Um, our state budget is too big. You know, where do you make up for the, for the, the delta on that? But what you are able to do is um, if, if we can start ratcheting down. So starting in 2024, we'll be at a 5%, which is great. Uh, Governor Kemp did an amazing thing um, by, by pushing that legislation last year. And I'm so glad that, um, that we're gonna go from 5.75 down to five. Um, I'd like to see us you know, aiming to get towards a, a three, two, one if, if we can uh, over the next several years. So I will continually um, be pushing for that as well. Talking about tax credits, something that that I've noticed in a lot of different places in Georgia's uh, the it's great to to grow businesses and so forth and uh, or businesses that reloc or located in Georgia and plants have been built that wouldn't have otherwise been built because of tax policy, but the downside is people live in an area or move to an area or remain there because they either like it or at least can tolerate it. But then you have this huge, for example, in Gwinnett County, I mean, God knows what the population is around a million right now. God knows what it'll be in 10, 20 years. I don't know that how that helps the citizens that live here. I don't understand what it's what's in it for them to have a 50% population increase in a short period of time. What, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think the state's role in that is? So, well, going back to Gwinnett, I, I think within three to five years, Gwinnett will be the largest county in the state where we're almost neck and neck with, with Fulton already. So um, I think as people are leaving Fulton County, um, a lot of them are migrating to, to Gwinnett. Um, Forsyth is, is uh, you know, also one of the fastest growing counties in the state. And so I, th I think between Forsyth and, and Gwinnett, um, my state Senate district is, is you know, a hotbed of, of where all of this explosive uh, growth is going to happen. Um, but, you know, to your point about tax credits and, and, you know, helping, you know, I mean, it's great that we have, you know, car manufacturers that want to come to Georgia. I love that. Um, but I think that if we make Georgia a great place um, for them to, to, to work, uh, for healthcare, for education, um, and at a very, very low state income tax rate or eventually no state income tax, that's gonna attract them more than giving them unfair advantages. And then Georgians or, or let's be really specific, people in, in, in our district that are, um, that are making up the difference for our state budget, by giving tax credits to, let's say, you know, a Hollywood, um, you know, film company, um, that certainly is uh, something that that we have to look at um, to to be fair for all Georgians. They were all equally carrying the burden, but if they want to come here for for reasons other than tax credits, then let's explore those and let's make sure that that everyone's paying their fair share. Let me ask you this: Is it unreasonable? for citizens to believe that voting ought to be done in secrecy. 
I get, I get an interesting okay. response from people when I ask that question. Voting in secrecy. Well, I mean, technically, we all vote in secret. Yeah, you, know, you know, in the sense that you know nobody sees what's what's on your ballot when you go into the the little dividers, right? Well, not uh, not if you vote by mail, and that's what I'm getting. That was what I was really getting at. So, my opinion on absentee ballots is this: um, I would be all for um, Georgia adopting absentee ballot requests to be based on need. Um, and only on need. And um, even in a, a, a liberal state like New York or Joe Biden's home state of Connecticut, or, um, Delaware, excuse me, uh, you know, you look at, at what their voting laws are with absentee ballots. They have to have an absentee ballot. You have to request it, it has to be given. And then you have to take it to a notary to stamp it and verify that you have presented your identification to prove that you are who you said you are when you filled out that, that ballot. I'm totally open to that. I think that what um, our Secretary of State did in 2020 by mailing out 6.8 million absentee ballots unsolicited um, was, uh, I know it was a COVID response, but I think that it was a, a response that was um, far greater than than what we needed. And um, and I think that it, it has, had a ripple effect, uh, you know, almost two years later, where we're still seeing the effects of that, and um, and and it has put our entire election um, uh, faith in the elective system um, in question for a lot of people. In my opinion, it's going to be, and I want to see what see what you think. People can't. A lot of people can't trust the results because with a with a with a mail you're receiving them, a ballot you're receiving the mail, there's no way to know if you're not seeding your vote, selling your vote, um, being intimidated, harassed. But aside from whether you trust the results or not, you also have the situation of, I don't understand, because then the day politicians make the decision how we're gonna vote. And I don't understand inserting that dynamic into people's lives where they, have to be hassled for their vote in that way, whether it's a family member or stranger or whoever it is. Is that I mean, reasonable? It, it is reasonable. I, I think that that medically necessary or for um, our military serving overseas, those are real reasons to have an absentee ballot. Um, Georgia has one of the longest early voting um, cycles uh, of any state in the country. You know, we have almost an entire month to early vote. If you can't make the time to early vote in a month, if you can't just take 20 minutes out of, out of your day in a four week window, um, maybe you need to re-examine your, your priorities in, in voting and, and how important that is. Um, there's just not a logical reason for everyday citizens to need um, absentee ballots unless there is some mitigating health issue or they are, like I said, serving out of the country. But you recognize there's a downside to just inserting that dynamic into people's lives. Absolutely. I mean, there are a lot of people that don't, they're not, they, for years they didn't vote because they're apathetic voters. So why have them been hassled to do something that they probably wouldn't do ordinarily? It, it just seems to me, not, and not only that, but you have for example, um, you probably heard this. Uh, oh, I get four votes now because I have three people in my household and they'll vote the right. way that I, and they may say this in jest, maybe they're serious, but you hear this all the time. And I just don't understand why people are okay with that being in their lives. You think it's the culture? You think that's politicians just trying to get um, an, uh, an edge of some sort? I, th I think people absolutely do think that way. Um, I think we certainly saw it in the 2020 election. Um, uh, there was a documentary that came out uh, a couple of months ago that, that, that talked about this in, in great detail about how people um, picked up large stacks of absentee ballots that had been harvested, collected, um, and then dropping them off at, uh, at locations um, in, in some of the, the prime uh, metro Atlanta counties didn't happen in rural Georgia. It happened in Fulton and DeKalb and Gwinnett and Cobb. And um, 
And I believe that that's very real. And so, um, you know, you mentioned that, that people are expressing concern over, um, you know, election security. That's a, you know, the number one part of it is, is the fact that, that people have been given a blueprint on how to um, be able to, to maybe three or four ballots for their family. Maybe it's 30 or 40 ballots that they collected from, uh, from people that uh, maybe in a nursing home or, or something else. I mean, it's just, there are questions um, as to, to one's um, motives in that. And I, that's why I believe that in-person voting is the, the best way to solve that unless someone is, is proven to be medically fragile and just unable to do it, unable to do it otherwise. Speaking of the COVID, uh, the, the lockdowns, um, do you think the citizens are owed an explanation as, or an estimation of what the quantifiable benefits were before there's a next shutdown? I like the way you worded that. And what I'm getting about is lives saved that would have been that would would, would have been lost had the shutdown been occurred, had not occurred. Um, the, it, it's probably not. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. It's probably I, I've seen many people talk about this, and that's probably something that can never be known. We'll never know the true number. Um, uh, we've all heard stories, uh, firsthand stories of loved ones lost um, for reasons other than COVID, but yet the cause of death on the, on the certificate was COVID. Um, we're, we're never gonna know the true number. Um, you know, the latest one is, is monkeypox. I, you know, kept hearing about that from my friends in California this week when we were fishing in Alaska, talking about, you know, the, the new big thing is monkeypox. We're all worried about that. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, Biden is in a great position for, uh, you know, for creating uh, a new medical crisis just in time before the, uh, the November elections. Um, Stacey Abrams, you know, if, if uh, God forbid she was our governor during this, this last COVID crisis, uh, she still happens wearing masks and, and under lockdown. Um, anything to exert more government control over, uh, over the citizens to be able to make free choices on that. So, um, you know, I will fight with my dying breath uh, for people to have the choice to, you know, what they're going to do with with masks, what they're going to do with vaccines. Um, that's their choice. And uh, I lost a very dear friend to COVID and it was COVID. Um, and he was a very anti-mask, um, anti-vax guy. And um, it caught up with him. And it was, it was really sad because um, we had been friends through Bible study, men's groups. And, um, and I think about him and, and I think that, um, you know, would it have made a difference? We don't know, you know, but we can, we can second guess that all we want. But, um, but I know that he was a believer and I know he is with God and I know that um, he wouldn't have wanted it any other way. So from that standpoint, um, I, he never, even in his last days ever said, gosh, I wish I would have done whatever he, he knew that it was just his time and, and he accepted that fate. And I'm not saying that that's the route that everyone needs to take with it, but, um, but that was his choice to make. And that, that is the most important part of all of that. Do you think the citizens are owed some sort of answer to that question before another shutdown is ever implemented? The question of whether there was a benefit well, or not. If we ask Fauci, he will say yes. If you ask Governor Kemp, he would say that we're never going to get real data to be able to say, you know, what we were owed. Um, you know, I admire so much the way our governor dealt with, with COVID as a small business owner. Um, if he had not handled it the way that he did, it would have been... Um, lights out for, for my business, for my industry. So um, I don't, I don't believe that, that he owes us an explanation. I, I know that the CDC is going to say that they did everything right. I certainly know that Fauci is going to say that he did everything right, even though, you know, we know in hindsight that, that he made a lot of uh, mistakes along the way. I just, yes, we can ask for an explanation, but from whom and, and, and how valid it would be, I, I don't know. 
The well, the interesting thing is the the county the counties were the ones the county governments were the ones driving these lockdowns in Georgia, and then the that was the first step. Right. I was, I'm curious to what your opinion is. There's no way. I mean, they'll tell you we don't have the resources to determine whether there was a benefit or not. Right. And I'm thinking, well, if you don't, if you if you don't have the resources to determine whether there's a benefit or not, then it really isn't your place to impose those kind of restrictions because that's there's the costs were, are here. We know that there were significant costs, but we just don't know what the benefits were. Sure. Um, well, on a firsthand basis, Dr. Audrey Arona, who ran um, the Corona task or all, all of the the virus task force for uh, for Gwinnett County. I think she was one of George's heroes in this because she always took a very measured approach in what she was doing. And as soon as she felt it was safe to take masks off of kids in schools, she cleared it. Now that we're seeing a spike, there's talk about kids putting masks back on, um, you know, when they go in in the fall. But she she looks at it from a balanced standpoint of public safety, kid safety, um, you know, really getting down to that, you know, that level of, of concern and then, you know, where different measures need to be. She's not gonna say anything about, you know, how to operate one's business, but she certainly will recommend it, you know, for, for county employees or, or school systems. Um, having just flown, uh, four times this past week, um, masks are, are still very much optional, even in the airports. Um, in, and so East Coast, West Coast, um, no difference in that. You know, what we're seeing in the airlines, what we're seeing um, in Seattle, in, in, uh, in Alaska, it's um, right now, it, it's still very much open. Um, I just hope we don't get back to that. Um, and uh, And I think that the general public response is that people are kind of done with it but there are people that just enjoy wearing masks now and they're wearing them even outdoors they're wearing them even outside of covid areas uh they um they just want to wear a mask for whether it's anonymity uh whether it is actually for for their own personal safety you know you got to wonder about that but um but if that's their right you know to be able to wear them i guess if, if they want to i just don't I don't think our state is ever going to go back to um, a lockdown the way that we saw uh, a year and a half, two years ago. So what I mean when you say is you don't think the state government has a role in that sort of thing? No, no. What, uh, what do you think the big, the most urgent itch issues the state legislature needs to accomplish in the next session? I, we still need to tighten up some things on elections. Um, I still really have a lot of questions about um, our use of drop boxes and the security of those. Um, going back to your question about, you know, absentee ballots, I, I think that that's all connected. Um, we need to tighten up on that. We need to tighten up on our tax policies. We need to absolutely um, do what we can here in Georgia to fight against the inflation that we're seeing, this uncontrolled amount of, of uh costs of, of goods and services and, and what's happening, um, how that's impacting, uh, you know, a, a young entrepreneur, how it's affecting a young family, how it's affecting people's abilities to get a, a home loan. Um, you know, housing prices have increased 50% in the last two years in, in many parts of, of Georgia, but especially in our district. And, you know, how are we going to be able to, 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 you know, ratchet that down to get to a more reasonable uh, level of growth that, that is sustainable um, for everyone. It's um, it's it's scary what's happening out there. And I, I look at my children and I think there's no way at this current rate that they would ever be able to um, do the things that, that I've been able to do in terms of start a business or, or buy a home. I just don't know that they could ever do it um, unless we can curb that. So for in as much as, as we can control here in Georgia, um, economic policies, tax policies, um, school choice, and, uh, and election, uh, you know, absentee and, and, and drop boxes, we, we have to 
study all of those. And those will be the things that I want to really make top priorities when I get there. The big things you see in the uh, mainstream media, I don't, I don't watch mainstream media, but um, or listen to Far, it. But, uh, that, that I do know that the big thing uh, is abortion law. Is that anything that constituents are uh, concerned about, uh, express concern about to you? Absolutely. Um, uh, and what, I get questions and what, on and what changes would you uh, advocate for, if any, in Georgia law? I was so proud of our state when we passed the heartbeat bill uh, a couple of years ago. I'm so glad that that has um, been supported with the Supreme Court ruling. And I believe that that is a bill that um, that we fought so hard to to get passed that that's that's what we wanted then. And I think that that's what we still want today. So I would advocate for no change um, that, that we would continue to to follow the heartbeat bill. So is there a, do you think there's an appetite for complete prohibition? There is an appetite for it, but I do not believe that if if it was on a ballot that it would pass. And I believe that if we tried to push for anything different than what we already have, we would be hard pressed to, um, to keep what we have. If uh, we, we could potentially um, lose the heartbeat bill if we tried to push for anything more. And so um, when the Georgia Life Alliance in, endorsed me, um, you know, this was a, a big question, uh, was, you know, where do I stand on that? And, um, I, I believe that the heartbeat bill is the, um, most, um, prudent, uh, way to, to deal with this. And so, um, there, there is an appetite for total, but I, it is, um, a vocal minority that is, is calling for it, but the majority of Georgians and certainly the majority of people that I've ever spoken to in my district, um, are, um, they, they've accepted where we are with, with heartbeat and, and we want to stay with that. What are uh, some realistic things that both parties can agree upon with in, in regard to the issues in Georgia? <laughs> um, I, I think we're, we all care about job creation. I think we all care about lower taxes. I think that we all care about better schools. Uh, I think we all care about helping to prop up the one out of three schools in Georgia that are failing right now. I think we can all agree that we need massive health care reform. Um, we have huge issues with um, certificates of need in our hospital health care systems. Uh, we have issues with Medicaid funding. We have issues with the exorbitant uh, cost of health insurance. So these are all issues that, that affect every Georgian. Uh, these are issues that um, I definitely want to reach out to um, my counterparts on the other side of the aisle on. And, uh, and I hope that they will be willing to, uh, to talk about that. Um, if, if the election goes the way we think it will go, um, you know, the Republicans will maintain um, a majority in the House and Senate. Uh, God willing, Governor Kemp gets reelected um, and Burt Jones becomes our lieutenant governor. But that doesn't mean that we don't want to reach out to uh, the Democrats and make sure that, that we're working with them and not alienating them in any way. What are the big, what are the big issues you disagree with uh, with, the, with your opponent or vice versa? Um, he's very pro-choice. Um, he, uh, and, and by that, do you mean so, something specific? You understand a specific um, position that has been taken? Sure. No, he, he's a, he's a very successful businessman. He's a, he's a good man. He's a nice man. He's a father. Uh, we have children about the same age. Um, we, we agree on, um, issues regarding healthcare. We agree on issues regarding property tax, um, we, we have some differences, you know, certainly regarding, um, you know, curriculum um, and, uh, and, and school choice. 
and uh, and we certainly differ on uh, on the uh, the life issue, but uh, he's he's very conservative. Um, but I think that he's um, not as in touch with the majority of the people in Senate District 48. But he is a uh, but he is a good man, and uh, and I I I've liked every interaction that I've had with him. Um, he uh, he seems reasonable in, in many ways, um, but but it is not a. Um, it's actually one of the more cordial races I think that are happening in the in the metro area. Um, that that we're not out there bashing each other. That we just want to lay out the differences between us, and and allow the voters to decide um, who the better person would be to represent them at the Capitol. Did, did I understood you say your opponent's very conservative? In some ways, I mean, he um, he has been very successful in his insurance business, and um, and he's he's very involved in the uh, the Bangladeshi community. He's he's uh, from that country, and um, and so he has you know been very active in in uh, in that culture, and and that brings a lot of the diversity to Johns Creek, and so um, uh, he and I both, even though I'm Caucasian, he's Bangladeshi, um, we, we both have so many friends in, um, in the Asian community, um, just, you know, by nature of, of where we live and, and what we do. Um, one of my campaign chairs is from Taiwan. Uh, you know, I, I'm heavily involved in the, uh, in the cricket organization of Johns Creek and, and, you know, that sport, which is uh, heavily, um, Indian and, you know, based. And, and so um, we have similarities and a lot of crossover, you know, with, with you know, shared interests in that. We actually live in the same neighborhood as well. <laughs> Interesting. I guess the last question I have is when you talk about school choice, there are 85% supported in the Democrat primary, these advisory questions uh, should the United States remove obstacles to economic advancements by forgiving all student loan debt? Well, uh, 85% said um, yes. And the thing that's, uh, I, th I think it's kind of interesting about that, if 85% of Democrats think that it would be okay to forgive college private tuition, uh, debt that uh, debt that was paid for private school tuition. I, I don't understand the lack of appetite for not just allowing parents to have <laughs> to allow their kids to go to um, a non-public school or some something other than a public school education. It's kind of that's kind of confounding to me. That I've, I, have you noticed that, or is that something that occurred to you? I'm furious about this topic. <laughs> this one really gets my blood pressure boiling. The, the fact that a, a small minority of our population that chooses to go to college, which I, I applaud the, the decision to go to college, but that their decision to do that and their decision to take on that debt now becomes the responsibility of every taxpayer who did or did not go to college has to then pay the debt to that makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Whether it's a public university, whether it's a private university, whether it's a trade school, that is not the responsibility of every taxpayer to, to take on that burden at all. It just is not their responsibility to do that. It is not anything that the state or federal government should ever consider that they would just forgive debt that another person created and chose to take on for themselves. Um, it, it's, it's a real popular topic with, with millennials and, and, and Gen Zers and, you know, Hey, yeah, let's, let's absolutely support that. Let's support the, the, the idea that I can go to college for free without having earned it academically or because of, of economic status with a choice with a choice yeah absolutely no it, it i will absolutely fight against that with every fiber of my being okay well uh is there anything else you want to add you've been very generous with your time i really appreciate you doing this 
thank you so much. Um, you know, if, if you have any questions or follow up, please uh, let me know. Um, my campaign website is is my name, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, still, S-T-I-L-L dot com. Okay. Is there any other places that can find you? Are you on Facebook or any of that sort of stuff? Sean Still for State Senate uh, on Facebook. And, um, you know, I was never even on social media before I decided to, uh, to run for office. So it's, uh, it's kind of fun to, to see all the, um, the support and, and comments and, and suggestions that we get. But uh, I have an amazing campaign team and um, an amazing campaign manager, uh, Olivia. She's a rock star from, from Johns Creek. She was actually the, uh, the first uh, female member of the high school football team in, uh, in, at Northview High. She was the kicker. And uh, she starts law school in the fall. And I'm just so proud of her and, and what a great job she does to, to support us and everything that we do. Well, thank you for, thanks again for doing this. Uh, this is our episode for today. I really appreciate you watching. Uh, if you like this content, please subscribe, like, share, comment, and thank you. Thank you.